Welcome to Weekly Service. We are so glad that you're joining us today. I know we say that just about every time, but we mean it every time. It's pretty cool to think that we've got people all over the world gathering in homes and cafes and gyms, uh, engaging with this content, talking with each other about the messages and the sermons and scripture and the person of Jesus and growing in our faith all over the world. In just a minute, we're gonna get to a brand new message, but before we do, I just wanna say thank you so much for standing on the front lines with us as you give to help us tell the story of Jesus to the world. It is not lost on us that we are only able to do what we do because of the generosity of thousands of people who call this their church, church home their community, and are living this life of generosity out. If you'd like to participate and join us, you can text the word generosity to 97,000. Camp season is among us. We've been talking about it in our weekly services, but kids are encountering the presence and the love of Jesus. And it really is because of your generosity that we're able to put on incredible in-person and digital camp experiences for our kids. So thank you so much for joining us on this generous journey. Hey, without further ado, check out a brand new message. Have you ever had anybody ever tell you, hey, 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 if you don't have any expectations, you'll never be disappointed. You just got too many, that's just false expectation. That's just disappointment because somebody didn't meet your expectations. So the key to life is just don't have, just don't have an expector. Just get rid of your expector. So what kind of life is that? Now we all live in lives like buckets with planned holes. Talking about, yeah, I got water, not for long. I mean, what is life without dreaming? What is life without expectation? What is life without believing? What is it? Now, for those of us that are Jesus followers and those of us that love Jesus and love the scripture and love the story and want to live, love, and look like him, we're a part of social, da- social Dallas. I, I want to tell you something. You need, to, you need to understand that God uses the language of visions and dreams, but his visions are from victory, from the finished work, not for victory or for the finished work. Now, as the United States of America, as a USA character, our dreams and visions in our culture are taught us you've got to dream about something you don't have so that when you get it, you'll be happy and fulfilled. I'm not against that, but I am not interested in discussing that dimension of dreaming and vision. I have no interest in that today. Now, if you want to dream about your business, you want to have visions, I'm, I'm going to be the first pastor in line with Pastor Robert and Taylor. I'm going to tell you right now, we are going to pray for your business. We're going to pray for your merch. We're going to pray for your sales. We're going to pray for your, uh, uh, that you get an increase in your salary. I am down for all of that. But the primary way God uses visions and dreams in the language of Scripture is from victory and the sign that your vision and dream is from God is it's too much for you and when you're done with it, it makes much of God and not of you. That's how you'll know this one might be from God. Why? Because I can't do it. And when I do do it, everybody will know who did it. Okay, so make no small dreams here. Do not proceed with caution. Life is short. You're going to be dead soon. We didn't start a church two years ago to play it safe and to perpetuate pomp, circumstance, and pageantry. I am down for getting dressed, but I'm also down to do what needs to be done to reach the streets of our cities and love people that don't know they're loved. To inform people you are ready. The provision has been made for your forgiveness. I am preaching and I am seven minutes in. I'll calm down. I'll calm down. I'll calm down. (laughs) Pastor Taylor, Pastor Robert, you know why I'm here. I'm here because I love you. And I said at the nine o'clock service, I didn't pray about this. I didn't ask God if he wanted me to be here. My friends asked me to come and I said, yes. And I said, hey, I'm sorry I didn't ask. But I knew it was a yes. I'm here for relationship. I'm here because I love you. I'm here because I believe in what's happening here. I'm here because I love this city. I'm here also under the authority of Bishop T.D. Jakes, who sits on our board and is a bishop in my life. And you better know I already texted him before I even landed in this city because I understand spiritual authority. 
Get out of here. You know I was kind of flexing a little bit when I said I was texting Bishop Jakes, but I don't want to get into it. I don't want to get into it. Love you guys, man. Thanks for having me. You're like, is he leaving? Was that it? <laughs> um, but I'm so grateful to see uh, Bishop Jakes and Pastor Furtick on the, on the screen. Uh, I didn't even know that we could do greetings to churches and tank tops. I got to be honest with you. I didn't know. I didn't know. we. I really didn't know we could do that. Nobody told me that. I thought that was off limits. Church, I grew up, but you can't wear a tank top to greet the man and woman of God in the ministry. Pastor Stephen up there, bam, bam. And Pastor Stephen's video looked like when your mom FaceTime you. You know, she's all up in her face. Mom, mom, pull the camera back. I don't got to be up here, Ma. I can tell you're 62, Ma. Hey, baby, how you doing, baby? Baby, you good? You good? Mom, I can't see your whole face. Pull it back. Pull it back. So I text Pastor Furtick, Flex. I text Pastor Furtick, and I said, your tank, man. I like the tank. <laughs> you would <a dick. laughs> I love church. I've been around long enough. I'll make fun of everybody, okay? So <laughs> you don't know who I am, but I've been here before you knew Jesus, okay? So, <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I love that, man. That was awesome. I'm doing that. I'm sending a video to my wife when I, before I take off. <sighs> hey, baby. Oh, Jesus, sweet Jesus. What we're we talking about? Dreams, visions, dreams. And visions. There's a scripture I want to read to you. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 7, I think. Hopefully, maybe they're going to put it on the screen. Anyways, it says this. It says this. In the last days, there it is. In the last days, it shall be. God declares that I will pour out my spirit on everybody. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Now, this is describing a phenomenon that quite literally, actually, physically happens within the church, within the community, and I want you to know what's happening to you, and I want you to know what's happening around you, and I want you to know what's happening to others. But what ends up happening in these uh, dynamic environments uh, as the local church, a community that we're saying, hey, we're going a particular direction. If you're down, if you want to roll, if you want to go, if you want to flow, like here, sign up, get involved, start serving, start loving, start caring. We're going to give our lives away. We're going to give our lives at the service of humanity. We're going to love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves. We're going to give up our finances and our resources, and we're going to sit in overflow rooms, and we're going to do greeters at the, at, at the doors. We're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to pick up confetti after the confetti cannons go off, like my least favorite job. But you know, like I used to do this, by the way. My dad used to love confetti in church, and I was his lead custodian, and I was like, Dad, I swear if you do one more confetti cannon, I am becoming an atheist. All right. This is tough to clean up, I'm just saying. But point is, what's happening to you is, well, I can predict it. Young people will start to see past the moment, and old people whose dreams have been driven out by life will return. So the young people will see past the moment. The old people will start dreaming dreams they gave up on because life has a way of driving them out. And all of a sudden, you get a confluence in a room continuity and community coming together with a sense of God. And now all of a sudden, you got young people seeing past the moment. You got old people dreaming fresh dreams. And now you're like, I want to go back to social talent. I like the feeling in the room. What you like is the visions and dreams that's happening. You got young people seeing past the moment. You got old people instead of just retiring and playing golf which sounds amazing now that I say it. <laughs> That's what I want. Lord, heal me, restore me because I'm ready to retire. But I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I've been doing this for 23 years, okay? I've been doing this for 20, long enough to know that you guys are mean sometimes, okay? I love you, but y'all are mean. Christians are mean. Be careful to Christians out there. They're mean, they're mean, they're mean, they're mean, they're mean. Somebody sent me, they said, hey, this guy critiques every sermon you preach every Sunday. I was like, now why in the world would you send me a clip of this, man? I don't need to hear this. By the way, he has some good points about my content. You know what I mean? You listen to your critics, you're like, now, that's true. I really didn't study that original language there. He got he got a good point. But the other day, we were in a service in L.A. A guy stood up, and he's like, enough about the dog, bro. Preach the Bible. I had been telling a dog story. He's got a new puppy, and I want to get into it. A little multi-poo. And 
And I was telling a dumb story about my dog for like 20 minutes. He's like, get on, get to the Bible. He sat down, everyone's like, ooh. And I was like, he's got a point. I have been on this story for quite some time. So God can use criticism as well. But the point is, I've been doing this long enough to know that when we get together, stuff happens when we get together and when we don't. And I see your light, your eyes light up, and I see your body respond, and I see God speaking to you about the future and speaking to you about what he can do. And I see people with gray hair and no hair and tons of hair and, and bleached hair and hair here, but not here. You know what I'm talking about? Hair here. You know, all right, Judah, don't start doing this. But, but, but all kind of ages, and we're coming together going, I have a sense of expectation of what God is going to do. Something about the environment is telling me God is up to something big. But I would like to warn you today that the personalization, the individualization of the dreams and the visions are fine. I am not against that. I will be your preacher who will always be somewhere like an uncle to Social Dallas. And listen, man, if you want to be the best barista in the world, you want to be the best dancer in the world, you want to be the best painter in the world, you want to be the best artist in the world, I am down. But if you would allow me the luxury to transcend individualization and the personalization of visions and dreams and speak to the dream and vision we are all connected to collectively. For it should be noted that is a priority to God. I love your brand. I love your website. I am here to support it. But what it's connected to is far, far more, how should I say, uh, 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 I was going to say important, but that makes people feel bad. It is Far more significant. That's still a tough word for people to handle. What's more significant than my coffee brand? Uh, a few things, but I know I'm in the United States of America, so you got to be careful when you start talking about God. God isn't for your brand. He's for your brand. But, you know, he's doing something. He's doing something. And all the kids are welcome at his table. But remember, it's his table. It's his family. It's his house. He's the father. You're the kids. Enjoy the potluck. But understand, this is for the king, by the king, through the king, and unto the king. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it is ultimately for him, by him, through him, unto him. So, so what I'd like to do, if you would allow me, in the super highway of individualization that has become the Western world. I would like to be the preacher who stands and says, I'm down. I just don't want to focus on that because I don't think it's as important. What you are connected to is in fact more formidable and important than what you connect to it, what you bring to it. Okay, uh, I'll just break it down a couple more, couple more ways. <clears throat> you know, I remember Sunday school and, and my Sunday school teachers would have us draw stuff and then you would like draw. And then when my dad got done preaching, he'd be like, how was Sunday school? This was in Portland, Oregon as a kid. And I would hand him my painting or my drawing and he would go. Buddy, what is it? I was like, it's Jesus Christ resurrecting from the tomb, dad. And he's like, oh, I thought it was Jurassic Park. Jesus looks like a T-Rex. That's adorable. Thanks, Dad. I, don't, I mean this in the nicest way. That is your vision for your life at best. I love you, but your heavenly father thinks you're adorable. You think you're a savant, and I'm sure you are, but he thinks you're adorable. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean that honestly. From best I can tell in my research and study and long-standing relationship with the Heavenly Father, I am convinced that we at best are adorable and he remembers that we're dust. And so we make these grand plans. How impressed are we with plans? You don't got to do anything. Just give us an impressive plan. And then 
do a TED talk about it and we'll all be dumbfounded. Have you done it? No, but it's my plan. <laughs> so the vision, so the church doesn't serve the vision. Does that make sense? Let me say it like this. God has a vision for the church and that vision possesses the church. The church does not concoct and create the vision. It aligns with it. I didn't come to be like teacher guy, but we in it. So let's talk about it. The goal here is not like, I wonder what Robert and Taylor are going to think about next. They don't know either. <laughs> this isn't about, tell us more of your plan. You should take over your dad's church, see what happens. Ask Joel Osteen what it feels like. You're like, dad's gone. I preached for six weeks. All my sermons were done. And this mega church in Seattle was like, we miss your dad. I'm like, so do I. It wasn't about you to give us your vision. It was about we're going to keep serving the vision. Yeah. Don't got to pray about it. Don't got to figure it out. It is what it is. So what I'm about to put in front of you is from best I can tell in my research and my study and my prayerful consideration of the story of the first Christians and the first churches and what they were doing is I have discovered that the visions and dreams that are prominent and prevalent in the story have far more to do with the collection, the community, than the individual. And I think that's something we're going to have to align with and at least sit with and ask ourselves about it. So be careful what you align with because what you align with oftentimes is more formidable and shaping and determines your trajectory more than what you concoct within yourself for the plan for your life. What do you, who do you align with? Covenants, alignments, right? So you've aligned with social Dallas. All right, all right, all right. I'm not trying to be complex. It's going to get gooder than this, okay? It's going to get gooder than this. We're just working through some stuff. So I'm going to give you three things. Three things that are the collective vision of the first Christians. Now, before we go there, I have to because I'm a good friend. I've got to tell you, you need to prepare yourself accordingly because this exercise might be confrontate, confrontative in nature. And I say that because many of us, like myself, are very, very consumed with our visions, our dreams, our mood board, vision board, mission statement. This is like very prevalent in our culture. I think that's adorable. I think your mission statement's adorable. I think your business is adorable. Judah, it is more than, it's a billion dollar business. Adorable. At best. Compared to the king of the jungle, the rose of Sharon, the beginning and the end. I think adorable is a nice way to say it, isn't it? Wood, hay, and stubble. God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. That is the ethos of the church. That he would cause his face to shine upon us and we would be the reflection of the sun to a broken, hurting world. What was the dream of the first Christians? What was the dream? I got no problem with our, our merch, our plans, and all this stuff. But what's the dream? What's the vision? What moved these first Christians to live extraordinary lives? Three visions that I see. Now, three dreams that I see. And like I said, I want you to be careful. I don't intend this to be confrontative. I don't intend this to be conflicting. I don't intend this to be, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, an affront to your plans or what you came in here with, but, 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 but assimilate accordingly and prepare yourself for an exercise that might adjust a few things in your life. The first dream of the first Christians was a better way. They dreamed of a better way. They dreamed of a better way. They dreamed about pens over swords, love over lording, and forgiveness over force. They dreamed of a better way. In fact, the name of the Christians, before we were given another name, Little Jesus, Little Christ, we were called people of the way. How we have forgotten the concept of movement, walking, and going his way. This is not about understanding his statistics 
or his history or his, it's about moving with him. The Message Bible says, walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it, Matthew 28. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. I want to prophesy to Social Dallas, that is your destiny. You're going to walk with him, you're going to work with him, and then you're going to watch how he does it. You're going to walk with him, you're going to work with him, and you're going to watch how he does it. Career is not the goal of this life, relationship is. Wealth and eternity is based on connection and relationship. For the asphalt is gold, the iron is pearls, and the water is crystal. Which is to say to the reader, who's deeply confused by the book of Revelation, that one thing you should not be confused about, that is that wealth and money is quite different home when you get home. This isn't home. Dallas ain't your home. I'm talking to some people who understand what I'm talking about. This is not your home. Don't acclimate to home because this ain't home. We're going to be home someday, but we're not home. Look around. This don't feel like home. There is injustices and inequities and there is uh, hypocrisy and there is even at the highest powerful figures of the land. This is not home. All the mystics, all the leaders, all the, the heroes, they knew this wasn't home, but someday we'll go home. But in the meantime, let us dream of a better way. Not better production. <laughs> Not better brands, better way. Travel a better way. They dreamed of a better way that they, they would overcome evil with good. A better way. Oh man, I'm, I'm a little tired talking about the better way. Sometimes it's hard to choose the better way. Sometimes it's hard. And you haven't been tested, you'll be tested. Bless those who curse you. Love those who use you. Can I ask you a question? I know we talk about love a lot in church. Can I ask Alicia a real simple question? And I really mean this from a real curious place in my own soul. When are we going to be enemy lovers? When is that going to happen to us? When are we? We still working on love those who don't totally love you. That's where we're at. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I love everybody who loves me. Why? Because I'm human, not because I'm Christian. People are like, yo, the six slides, bro. Thanks, Robert Madu got them for me. I just really like that guy. Well, he complimented you for 15 minutes. I bet you do. When, when does the church stand as a beacon of distinction? Because we love enemies. I'm asking... Where is the better way? I didn't ask for a better sermon. I didn't ask for better music. I didn't ask for better art. I didn't ask for a better cup of coffee. I asked for a better way of life. The life of love. The life of forgiveness. The life that conquers bitterness and envy and jealousy and strife and the likes of which comes wars, rumors of wars, oppression of all kinds. Where is the better way? Not a better church or a better brand, but a better way. That's what the Christians dreamed about. Show me the better way. Jesus said, follow me, and started walking. I like him a lot. That's exactly what I'm about. I don't need some insecure leader talking about, do you want to come? If you come, I'll pay you. How much an hour do you require? Do you want to come? You got to be here? You got to do that? Come on. He's like, follow me. And people are like, well, he, he didn't explain his vision, though. He didn't tell me where he's going. I'm not following nobody until they tell me where they're going. All right, all right, all right, all right. Everybody's got a blog now. Is your blog a part of the better way? <laughs> if I have one more person tell me how to preach who's never preached, it's not going to be well for me. Oh. Oh, OK. 
Okay. Interesting. Okay, I won't talk about what you do for a living. You don't talk about what I do for a living. And we just call it good. In fact, let's focus on people broken, hurting, and dying, and let's not be connoisseurs of the communicators in the church. I ain't got, I got, I got friends that don't know Jesus. I don't have time to debate with you who is the top 10 Christian communicators in my favorite podcast. Grow up! That's how I really feel. Grow up and get out more, man. People out here dying. We all discussing who's better at preaching. Grow up. Got no more time for that. Feel like preaching bad just to make a point. But I can't. All right, but anyways. God gave you a gift. You better use the gift. I didn't earn this. I didn't deserve this. I didn't warn this. This wasn't my study. This wasn't my morals. This wasn't my integrity. This wasn't my ethics. This was the choosing of God. And God chooses who he chooses. And if he gave you a gift, you can sit back and apologize or you can utilize and be who God called you to be. And tell your Bible college friend who's not here today that I said that. Got 11 minutes. I didn't even start it. Feel a little fire. I'm not angry. I'm happy. Just so you know. Somebody came up to me and he said, like, you are very angry. And I'm like, oh, you have mistaken my pure joy. Because of the intensity of my joy, you thought I was angry. I'm excited. I'm 44 enough to tell people the truth. Come at me, Bible college student. I need to spend some time with you. A better way. Number two, their second dream was a better empire. A better empire, a better home. Why don't we talk about heaven in church? We're so consumed with the here and the now, and yet here is fading and finite and fickle, and the future is finished and sure. I am looking for a new generation who will go back to the future to understand the way that you move down here is understanding that you're on your way there. I'm being so serious. You do the history of this country. You start to understand men and women who were oppressed, men and women who were absolutely overlooked and marginalized. Our heritage, even within this country, is there were whole remnants of believers who believed that though there was a justice down here, someday, somehow, he's going to catch us and take us home, and all will be well. I'm serious, man. We got to talk more about forever. But we're absolutely preoccupied with what is finite. And so we struggle in the finite because we're disconnected from the forever. And so we fall for finite, fickle things because we're not connected to forever. So we want money like everybody else. We want fame like everybody else. We want riches like everybody else. Hey, be who you are. Ooh, I'm talking to somebody and I'm going to get happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I really am a happy guy. But I'm passionate, man. We're struggling down here because we don't know the streets of gold. We don't know the gates of pearl. We don't know the crystal sea. We're unfamiliar with wealth and its context there. Their gold is asphalt. And we're supposed to know that. Nobody cares about what, how big your bank account is. We want to know, is there room in your heart to forgive me? Can you forgive your dad? Can you let go of what your mom did last year? We were all in the middle of a lockdown. Just give her a little bit of grace. I know you hadn't talked to her since she said what she said to you. And you're busy building your brand. And I think the father wanted me to ask you, but when are you going to forgive your mom? There's a better way. There's a better empire. And I'm done. And now if the... 
the, the master piano player will come and, and, and play with me. Honestly, man, talk about a master class. Like the, 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 the musicians and the singers, it was so gorgeous and beautiful. And I just want to say thank you. Um, that means a lot. And I know it's a lot of sacrifice for what y'all do. I was standing side stage and I'm like, we don't need a preacher that bad. And so we're going to get back to that in a moment. How about that song, All My Life You Have Been Faithful? Well, I, listen, I'm not named Judah for nothing. I started as the worship leader. Don't get me started. I, I will. I will. I will. <laughs> it's like four people are like, do it. Everyone else is like, who is this guy again? <laughs> I'm done. The first Christians, they, they dreamed of a better way. Love over lording. Pens over swords. Forgiveness over force. They dreamed of home. They talked about home a lot, and it was never here. That's why many of them died and considered it to be an honor. Because all the more. Paul said, I, I'm very torn, you know. I want to go home so bad. But I want to stay, too, because if I stay, it's good for you. But if I go home, everything will be right. He said, I am hard pressed between the two realities. Have you ever been hard pressed? Oh God, I want to go home. Okay, son. In the blink of an eye, in a moment, this vapor of life will be gone. But in the meantime, son, man, your position. Stay in your course. Love your wife. Raise your kids. Serve your neighbor and care for your friends. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My friend and I were talking yesterday, and he said, Judah, will I get to see physical, visible Jesus? I said, oh, yes, you will get to see Jewish Jesus. Did you know that Jesus is Jewish forever? Did you know that? The same Jewish Jesus that the woman caught in adultery when she looked through the dust and the dirt and the hair in her eyes and she saw him. You will see him. You will see his hair. You will see his nose. You will see his ears. You will see his eyes. And my friend said, I'm not trying to be crass, I'm being dead serious. My friend's been through so much pain and so much loss and so much agony. And Jesus is so real to him. He said, can I kiss Jesus on the lips? I said, absolutely. He said, I don't mean to sound weird, Judah. I know I'm 29, but I can't wait to kiss him. He said, me too, man. I'm tired. I'm tired. How did the first Christians keep going? They believed in the way of Jesus. They believed in the empire of heaven. And lastly, they dreamed of a better king. Oh, I caution you all believers. Be careful who you make king. I don't know if you play for the blue party or the red party as if this country was intended to only have two parties. Get out of here. I got no interest in CNN or Fox, to be frank. I have signed up for one king. And whoever is voted in here, up until the point, they're consistent with what the king tells me, I'm down. But y'all better be careful now because you let a preacher come to town, to Dallas, Texas. If the king of this country tells me to do something that that king says, no, I shall not. Hey, you like, Jew, to be careful. I'm just telling you, study your Bible. Book of Acts. <laughs> You're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. Can we, um, can, can the whole band join me? Are, are we doing that? Are you, are you guys coming up anyways? Okay, 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 come on, come on, come on. Because we're going to sing this song in a moment. Okay, so what you may not know is that there was a, a sayer 
or a, how should I say, uh, man, kind of like a hype guy for Caesar. There was a hype guy. Now, what would happen when Caesar, the king of Rome, when he was carried through villages and towns and Roman streets, the hype man, the speaker, the sayer would go out in front of the caravan and he would declare these four things about Caesar. This was his declaration. Now, if you lived within the domain of Rome, you would know this. And this is exactly what the first Christians were dealing with. When the sayer would come down the street, Caesar would be carried in his caravan, carried on the shoulders of men. The speaker would come out and say, there is only one who can open the scrolls of the gods. There is only one. His name is Caesar. And everybody, and the men would walk by. No one would dare say a thing against the king. The speaker would continue to walk with his chest out. And he would say, there is only one son of God in all of Rome and all of the earth. And that son of the living God is Caesar. And everybody would yield Caesar, Caesar, Caesar. The caravan would continue. These are actual statements. And I'm doing my best to give you direct quotes. Historically recorded, the sayer and the speaker would say there is only one who sits at the right hand of the gods, Caesar. And everybody would say yes, 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 yes. And the last one you may recognize. Lastly, the speaker, the sayer, the hype man in front of the caravan as Caesar sat in his pomp and his pride and his arrogance in his caravan, the speaker would say, there is no other name given among men by which men can be saved, save Caesar. People, we think that spirit is gone. I'm too old to play games, y'all. I'm too old. I've been, you see all this gray hair? Hair's getting clear on me. Losing hair every day. I, I got no time. We, you don't think that spirit is still alive? You bow your knee to the system. You bow your knee to the king of the earth. I'm talking about the king of heaven. I'm talking about the king of the jungle. I'm talking about the lion of the tribe of Judah. Talking about the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Talking about the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. I'm talking about the focal point of humanity. I'm talking about the desire of all nations. I'm talking about the treasure of all human history. I'm talking about the star breather. I'm talking about the rhino maker. I'm talking about the river maker. I'm talking about... So the first Christians, guess what they wrote in our book? Don't you know the scripture? The Christians stood up and they said, there is no other day given among men by which we must be saved except Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem from Nazareth for he is king and he is the immutable and he is the unchangeable and he is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. I came to Social Dallas to speak into the soul and soil of this community. Don't you let your dreams be small. Don't you let caution guide you in the days of head. The culture is, is hemorrhaging. People are crying. What we don't need is more brands and brands and bands and just merch and stuff. What we need is dreams and visions. What we need is a better way. What we tell us about a better empire. Tell us about a better king. Tell us about the one who can save. Tell us about the one who can deliver. Tell us about the one who can heal all the vices and plights that plague man. Tell us the one who can heal and restore. Only Jesus can do that. Haven't we learned? Haven't we been here long enough to know that man will make his promises, but he can never deliver? 
truly. For with man it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Jesus stands in the temple and he opens the scroll. Only Jesus could open the scroll. He came up from the Jordan River and there came the triune Godhead in physical visible form for you could hear the voice of the Father and the dove of the Spirit and the soaking wet body of the Son. He comes out of the water and the heavens declare, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The Bible says he sits in the heavens and he laughs at his enemies. He sits, he sits. Sit is the posture of finished and completed work. I am telling you all of your error, your wrong, your sin, your shortcomings, past, present, and future has been completely and utterly covered in the finished work of Jesus. His blood is enough. His sacrifice is sufficient. You are not defined by your behavior. You're not defined by, by your procedure. You are defined by the finished work of Jesus. Christ. Him and Christ of a new creation. Only Jesus sits in the heavens. The earth is his ornament and he laughs at those who oppose him. Came to tell you about the champion of the ages. The one who does not lose and cannot lose. The one who does everything he says and says everything he does. His word is true. And you know who he is? He's the only one that can save. He's the only one that can save the United States of America. He's the only one that can save the human soul. He's the only one that can change the heart of kings and leaders and ambassadors and empires and dictators. He holds the heart of the king in his hands. When he come to Dallas for another church service, we came to see the world change. And our ancestors seem to woo us onward. Come on. Don't you stop. I was watching the XFL last night. I know a league you didn't know existed, but this young man, this Samoan man, and I love the Islander people so much. The Samoan man says, when I come at you, I play safety on our team. And when I come at you, all my ancestors, and all of those in my heritage who have gone on before, when I hit you up across the middle of the field, you better know it's me and all my ancestors coming down on you. I got up in my hotel room last night. And I was like, okay, I might need to play safety. Shut up. But I was like, that's right. And come up here to preach just me. All my ancestors are behind me. All that great cloud of witnesses is behind me. Pick up this mic. You pick up these instruments. We're joining a chorus of singers and dancers and writers and artists. And we're singing the song of eternity. And we're singing the song of forever. And we're singing the song of victory. And we're singing the song of our champion. And we're singing the song of the redeemed. We're singing the song of the healed. We're singing the song of the miraculous. We're singing the song of the restored. Hey! It is not by might, it is not by power, it is by my spirit, says the Lord. There are people here up under the sound of my voice. You have a heritage in the house of God. And you have abdicated that heritage. That heritage hurts you, maligned you, misunderstood you. But God is about to restore your heritage. God is about to restore your story. God's going to heal you in this house. God's going to restore you in this house. What God started, he'll be faithful to complete it. You were meant for a home, friend. You were meant just for this place. You were meant for a new heaven and a new earth. And that day will come and all it takes is simply receiving and believing that Jesus is the Savior of the world. If you believe and you'd like to receive the free gift of forgiveness that only comes through Jesus Christ, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down. And I believe when you respond on the outside to what's happening on the inside, it just makes it more real to you. You know who you are. God's talking to you right now. We're going to go right back into this song. But you know who you are on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, shoot up your hand all over the auditorium. God, you see these hands. You see these lives. You see these hearts. And we 
thank you that we are forgiven forever, saved forever, past, present, future, totally and completely forgiven in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. If you have any questions about today's message or maybe just wanna to talk to a pastor about your relationship with God, please reach out to us on Pastor Chat. We have pastors waiting right now to talk to you. And one of the cool things that we can do on Pastor Chat as well is get you connected with other people near you. Whether you believe it or not, there might just be a group of church home people connecting in person or digitally in a city near you. And we'd love to help introduce you to them. And if that's something that you would like to find out more about, talk to a pastor on Pastor Chat and we can get you connected. And one of the other ways that we connect people at church home, but specifically families and our kids is through digital parties. I love that so many of our families from really across the world Part of their weekly rhythm is not just watching the content, but their kids are able to hop onto a computer screen where they're able to hear the church kids' message, connect with a kid's pastor, play a game, laugh, do group time, all the things that kids should be a part of, but yet they're able to do that in a digital space and be connected. It's really special. And if you have a family, if you have kids specifically, we'd encourage you to check out Church Kids Digital Parties. Thank you again for joining us for our weekly service, and we'll see you next time.